So we are using partial fractions in section 7.4. The partial fraction decomposition. Um, to integrate things that look like a polynomial divided by a polynomial. Some polynomial divided by another polynomial. You always check it. It's a UDU substitution before we try anything. This is just that polynomial terms on top divided by polynomial terms on the bottom. And the fraction is in reduced form, meaning the degree on top is strictly smaller than the degree on the bottom. What do, we, what do we need to do if the degree on top is not smaller than the degree on the bottom? Divide otherwise. And this partial fraction decomposition allows us to write our fraction as the sum of simpler fractions that we know how to integrate. And the fractions that we know how to integrate are the one over u du uh, or the arc tangent of u pops up quite a bit when you use the polynomial. Right? So be on the lookout for the one over u integral and the arc tangent integral. And so I don't know which examples I worked for you. I didn't work anything for you, did I? Was there are people wandering around back there? Let's keep your name to that tomorrow. Okay, so here's an example. Suppose we're asked to integrate 5x minus 12. Divided by x times x minus 4. Multiply out the denominator, it would look like x squared minus 4x. So I know that's a degree higher than the top. I also check to see if there's a UDU availability. So the derivative of x squared minus 4x is 2x minus 4. And I don't have any way to make the numerator look like 2x minus 4. So I'm going to try to find simpler fractions. And what we noticed before is that if this is in reduced form, then the addition of fractions with the individual factors as their denominators uh, is the way that we're going to go about this. We're going to figure out something over x and something over x minus 4 that adds to that fraction over there. And so I'll do that aside, and then I'll come back in and fill that in. So let's do the partial fraction right in here. Okay, so I'm going to try to find fractions. So I'm going to set up the equation. So this fraction on the left is equal to the sum of these two fractions. And these two fractions are first degree terms, linear. And so if we have distinct linear factors, then 
can you guess a constant as a numerator? In your factors, numerators will be constant. Oh. We can't get a fraction in reduced form if we have two fractions that are in reduced form. So that's the thinking here. So I put a constant here and here, and I'm going to solve for my two unknowns by solving this equation for A and B. Two unknowns, I'm going to need two equations. So I'm going to convert this from a rational equation to a linear equation by multiplying both sides by this denominator. I'm going to multiply the left hand side by x times x minus 4, and then the right hand side by that. When I multiply the right hand side, I multiply each factor by that. And that allows me to cancel the denominators everywhere. Over here, these both cancel here. And the right hand side, x cancels. So a is going to be multiplied by x minus 4. And the x minus 4 cancels here. So b will be multiplied by x. So on the left hand side, we're left with 5x minus 12. On the right hand side, I'll have a times x minus 4 plus b times x. See where I got that equation? Is that okay? Now I'm going to put the x terms together on the right and the non x terms together. So that I can match them up. So over here, I'm going to have an ax plus a bx. So the right hand side says a plus b times x. And the non x term is going to be a minus 4a. So we can see pairwise what these things have to be. The number in front of the x over here, a plus b, has to match the number in front of the x here. So one equation we get is that 5 is equal to a plus b. The constant over here has to be the same as the constant there. So our second equation says negative 12 is equal to negative 4a. That's called equating coefficients. Coefficient of x. Gives me the equation 5 is equal to a plus b and for the constant I get that negative 12 is equal to negative 4a. That second equation tells me a has to be positive 3. Then if I put that in where the a is up here, I have that 5 is equal to 3 plus b. So b is going to be 2. I have my a and b. The a and the b go above the x and the x minus 4 respectively. So put the a here. Make sure you don't get them mixed up. Make sure they're labeled. And then put the b there. And we have two easy intervals to do. Right? Here, if u is x minus 4, du is dx. So that's just going to be a logarithm. And that was already a logarithm. So we have 3 times the natural log of x plus 2 times the natural log of x minus 4 plus b. The calculus part. You can do it in one line. You got a little algebra to go through uh, in order to get the calculus for you. This was the case where we had distinct linear factors. If ever we have a repeated factor, we have to think backwards in terms of the common denominator. 
for instance, if I have these fractions and I'm adding them together, what is the least common denominator? Suppose I'm adding three over X plus seven over X squared minus five over X cubed. So far, what's the least common denominator of those three fractions? X cubed. And now maybe I add a uh, one over X plus two. And now what's the least common denominator? X cubed times X plus two. And if I add another X plus two version here, Now, what's the least common denominator? It would be an x plus 2 squared times the x cubed. So this comes from some fraction that has an x. We have to get the common denominators and we can figure out the numerator, right? So we're going to work backwards. If you have linear factors with powers on them, your partial fraction decomposition has to look like that. For the x cubed, I have to have all three versions of the x. x to the first, x to the second, x cubed. Same thing for the x minus 2 squared. I need both possibilities, the x plus 2 and the x plus 2 squared. So we need to write out the most general score. So this will be our repeated factor rule. Whatever the power is right here, you have to have factors binding to that power. Same deal any, for any repeated factor, whether it's a linear factor or not. There's an x cubed, I need an x, an x squared, and an x cubed. Otherwise, you might miss some terms. It's possible some of these would be missing, right? If this had a zero in the numerator, I still have the same common denominator. But when we're writing out our partial fraction decomposition, we exhaust all possibilities. So let's try. Like this one. x squared plus 6x minus 11 over x times x minus 1 all squared. If you did multiply out the denominator, what degree would it be? It's an x to the third power. So it is degree higher than the numerator. This fraction is going to be four. X squared plus six x minus eleven doesn't factor. I always kind of look at this as factor and cancel. Make it probably easier off the bat, but I pick one that doesn't factor and cancel. Um, I don't think it's going to be a UDU integral. Let's see, x squared minus two x. So I have an x cubed minus two x squared. So that'd be nope. This 
that we need to address. So yes, that is partial fractions idea. According to what I said over there, it's possible that three fractions can be added to make this one. Something over x plus something over x minus one plus something over x minus one squared. So that's what we're going to try to break it down to. We just take our fraction here. Let's see if we can find fractions that fit that pattern. So both x and x minus 1 are linear, so we keep guessing just constants up here. Then we do that step where we make this uh, get rid of the fraction. We multiply both sides by this denominator. And so when I take that denominator and multiply them up in here, I'm going to have the x squared plus 6x minus 11 left over there. Can you do this part in your head? What do you get when you take this fraction and multiply it by that denominator? k times the x minus 1. I'm going to take that, multiply it over here, and one of the x minus 1 can cancel, so I'll have b times x times x minus 1 to the first. Finally, if I take that denominator and multiply it up here, the x minus 1 squared can cancel, so c will just be multiplied by x. Then we can do this equating coefficient stuff. Multiply out the right hand side, select all the x squared terms, all the x to the first terms, and follow the constant terms. That's kind of a long way. I'm going to do it that way, and then I'll be back up here and show you a shorter way. So here's the long way. Just multiply it out. x minus 1 squared multiplies out to x squared minus 2x plus 1. This multiplies out to x squared minus x, and that's still cx. So now let's select our x squared terms. We're just going to have an a plus b. My x to the first power term would be a minus 2a minus b plus c. Minus 2a minus b plus c. And my constant term will only come from here, a times one. So I'm kind of multiplying it out and grouping like terms. Now I'm going to make the coefficient of the x squared equal to one another, the coefficient of the x is equal to one another, and the constants equal to one another. Coefficient of x squared over here is a 1, and over here it's a plus b. The coefficient of x over here is the minus 2a minus b plus c, and the coefficient of x over here is 6. That gives me my second equation. My third equation says that negative 11 is equal to a. So we got A, we can back up to the first line, substitute that in to get B. 1 is equal to negative 11 plus B, says that B has to be 12. Now we have A and B, we go to the middle equation and get C. The middle equation then will read 6 is equal to negative 2 times negative 11 minus 12 plus C. So I have 22 minus 12 plus C. That's a 10 plus C is equal to 6. 
So C is negative four. Kind of thrilled about that because I just made that problem up and I got nice and easy values for my A, B, C. Thank you very much. Okay, so in order to integrate this, we just integrate these three pieces with those numbers in the right plot. Break it up into three integrals. A divided by x will look like negative 11 over x. B divided by x minus 1. So I have 12 over x minus 1. And then C is negative 4 divided by x minus 1 squared. For the last two integrals, we'll take u dx minus 1. So du is dx. So here we're just integrating 12 over u. But here you're integrating negative 4 over u squared. 12 over u would be a logarithm, but 4 over u squared won't. You integrate 4 over u squared by writing that as 4 times u to the negative 2, and you use your power rule. Right? So let's come down here. The first integral is a logarithm. So we get negative 11 natural log of the absolute value of x. 12 over u is another logarithm. So we get 12 natural log of x minus 1. Now it's your turn. What do you get when you do this third integral? Negative 12 plus 4 over x minus 1. I add 1 to get a negative 1. Divide by that negative 1 gives me a positive 4. You get a negative 1 and it leaves on the bottom. Mm -hmm. No, because in the integrator, it's going to be minus 1. Right? Sorry? Oh, you want to see the easier way in? Yeah. I gotta, I gotta fix this so the folks at home can see it. I got kind of the board cut off here. You want to do the easier way. Why would you want to do it easier? Isn't that easy enough? Uh, it still didn't work. Let me pull the answer down just a little bit. Here, minus four over x minus one. Oh. All right, let's go back to this line here. Let's skip the multiplying it out step. Let's tell you a shortcut. So I'm going to erase all this other stuff. Keep in mind the numbers we got, because we're going to get them again a little bit quicker. This line holds for all values of x. So if I find some values of x that I could substitute to make some of the factors disappear or take on a value of zero, when the other ones don't, then I can get some of my variables cheaply. Like, for instance, if I take this line and replace x with 1, both a and b would be multiplied by 0, and I'll get the value of c. So if I put a 1 in on the left, I get 1 plus 6 minus 11. And again, if I put 1 on the right, I get a times 0 plus b times 0 plus c. So I have 7 minus 11. That's the negative 4 that we got earlier. 
Now let's grab another value of x. Do you see one that would make a nice substitution? X is zero, we drop out the C and the B and give us A. I put a zero over here, all that's left is the negative 11. If I put a zero here, I have a negative one squared times A. If I put a zero here, B is gone and C is gone. So I get the A is negative 11. Still missing a variable, but I don't have any other obvious factors that I could go away, they go away by choosing an X, but I need one more number. Pick any number, put your favorite number in there. And generate an equation that has A, B, and C in it, and you already have A and C, so you get B. So if your favorite number is 17, go for it. I'm not going to use 17, I'm going to substitute in 2. If x is 2 over here, I have 4 plus 12 minus 11. If I put a 2 in to the x minus 1, I'm just going to get a 1. So I have a. That's a 1, but that's a 2. a plus 2b plus 2c is equal to that number over there. And now let's put our a and c in there and solve for b. So that's 1, that's 5 here. a is negative 4. B we're looking for, two times C is a negative A. Do we have enough? Yes. Negative 11. That a way to stay awake. Okay, so I get a negative 19 here. I'm going to take that negative 19, add it to both sides. 19 plus five is 24, is two B. And by gosh, B is 12. I think it's shorter. It's not too much. I mean, if you only have two variables, do whatever you want to do. When you have those equations, when you have four or five variables, it's sometimes hard to stop solve by equating coefficients, solving five equations with five unknowns. So this, or do a mixture of both, right? If there's one jumps out at you, choose the other. Okay, the other case is if you have a second degree denominator, a second degree fraction is in reduced form if its numerator is one degree less, or at least one degree less. So if you have a second degree denominator that's a prime factor, can't be factored anymore, then you guess a numerator of first degree. Suppose you have a denominator that looks like, say, an x squared plus something. Two. x squared plus a number can't be factored. x squared minus a number can be factored, but x squared plus can't be. So that's a prime factor. So if you have something like this as one of your denominators, you put a first degree term up here. Similarly, if you have a prime third degree factor, you put a second degree term up there. Harder to decide whether a third degree factor is prime. So I'm going to see if I can kind of make one up. I don't think that factors. Maybe it does. I, I don't, if it factors, it has rational zeros. I tried to make it so it didn't. Rational zeros have to be ratios of factors of 17 divided by factors of 1. And I just don't think it's going to work. If you have a prime third degree factor, you guess a second degree factor up here. Just to get the most general case. We're not going to do these because. 
very rarely are we even able to integrate something of degree three. Right? You know how to integrate things in the denominator of degree two. That's degree three. Yeah. Okay? So just in general, whatever the degree is on the bottom, the numerator in our partial fraction decomposition should be one degree less. And if you have a repeated factor, you do the same repeated factor rule. Try to use the numerator. So if I had uh, an x squared plus two cubed with some blah, blah, blah up here, then I have to have it to the first power. I have to have it to the second power. And I have to have it to the third power. Each time with a more general numerator, right? So the algebra can get messy. Our example next will look like we ask you to integrate x eight x squared plus three x plus twenty divided by x plus one times x squared plus four. So we make the checks to see if we can integrate it already. Then we make the check to see if it's in reduced form. Is the degree on top less than the degree on the bottom? Then we say I'm going to break it up into partial fractions. Okay, you're going to recognize that this is a prime factor because of the plus sign. On the other hand, if this were a minus plus sign, x squared minus 4 factors as the difference of squares. The plus doesn't factor. So let's bring it down here to all the algebra. Linear factor of x plus one, and a second degree factor of x squared plus four. If the linear factor should go one degree less, quadratic factor should go one degree less. So I have three unknowns that I need to solve for. So you gotta remember this step because if you forget the C. You'll get numbers for A and B. They'll just be wrong. If you forget the BX, you'll get numbers for A and C, but they'll be wrong. Which makes your integration wrong. So make sure you just remember this basic little rule. Okay, in order to solve this, I'm going to multiply both sides by x plus 1 times x squared plus 4. So picture this, multiply here, picture this, multiply there. When it's multiplied here, the x plus 1's cancel, and a will be multiplied by the other factor. Let's put the bx plus c in parentheses, and what will it be multiplied by? x plus 1. Okay, so this one's easy enough to equate coefficients. It's also easy enough to stick some numbers in for x. Can you see the value of x that'll give us a quick result? X is negative one, we'll make this whole second batch go, and we'll be able to find a. So negative one squared is one, times eight is eight, 
Then I'll have a minus three plus 20. Negative one squared plus four is five. And then that times zero is zero. So I have five A is 25. So A is five. There's an x all by itself. How about we choose x to be zero? If x is zero, the left hand side just gives me 20. Zero here says four times a. Zero here wipes out b, leaves me c times one. So four a plus c. But a was five. I have 20 is equal to 20 plus C. Looks like C is going to be zero. <laughs> That's okay. Where my finger goes to. So you can take the C to send the X to the other side. Yep. Um, now there's not another quick choice. So just put your favorite number in there. I'm going to let X equal one. 17 is a favorite number, knock it out. But if X is one, I have eight, 11 plus 20 is 31. Then I have five A and I have B plus C times two. B plus C times two is two B plus two C. C is zero, so that's gone. A is five. I have 31 is equal to 25 plus 2b. Subtract that, gives me 6. So b is 3. Now we take those three numbers, we put them back up into here, and that's what we integrate to get that integral. So let's write this as the integral of a which is five over X plus one plus the integral of B, B is three. So I have three X plus zero all over X squared plus four. We can all do the first integral, right? How do you do the second interval? Mm -hmm. U is equal to x squared plus 4. DU is 2x dx. Half u is x dy. So the second integral is a 3 half integral, 1 over u du. So they're both logarithms now. Follow the crooked line. Here's our answer. Five times the natural log of X plus one plus three halves times the natural log of U. But U is X squared plus four. Three halves natural log of X squared plus four. So I got cut off, let me see what that one. This one. this one might be quick enough for us. That's eight minutes.
So you should notice two things about this one other than it's not a UDU integral. First thing you notice. Okay, I haven't factored for you, but you can factor. But don't do that yet. The degree on top is not smaller than the degree on the bottom. So let's do long division first. Divide first. Take the bottom, divide, use polynomial division, divide that into the top. So let's see. I have x to the fourth minus one, and I'm dividing into x to the fifth plus x. So just look at the lead term. What do I multiply x to the fourth by to get this lead term? This is x. So I take this x and I multiply both of those and I get x to the fifth minus x. But now I have to subtract that line from the line above it. And that gives me a 2x remainder. I know it's my remainder because it is lower degree than my divisor. So I can write my fraction as the whole part plus the remainder over the divisor. x plus 2x over x to the fourth minus 1. And so if you're stumped at this point, you go ahead and go for the partial credit, integrate x, get your x squared over 2, and now we're going to figure out how to do the rest. So here's where I think partial fractions would be the easiest thing to do. Now you factor x to the fourth minus one is the difference in squares. x to the fourth minus one is the same as x squared minus one times x squared plus one. Agree? x squared plus one is prime, but x squared minus one can be factored. That factors as x minus one, x plus one, times x squared plus 1. So we're going to break this fraction up. Into three fractions. And we'll come back up there and integrate those three fractions. So. I'm going to set this 2x over x minus 1, x plus 1, x squared plus 1, equal to the sum of three fractions. Like that, with these factors represented. Now, what do we put on the top of the degree? Those are A here, B here, CX plus B. So we have four unknowns. So we solve for four unknowns in two minutes or less. Let's set it up and read. We cross multiply, leaving me a 2X here. After you cross multiply, what will A be multiplied by? plus one times x squared plus one. The other two factors. So b will be multiplied by x minus one times x squared plus one. And then the cx plus b will be multiplied by x minus one x plus one. 
So here's where it's real handy to do that little trick when you start substituting in values of x. So how about when that x equal negative one? So I get a negative two over here. If x is negative one, then a is multiplied by zero. B is multiplied by negative two times two. And the CX plus D would be multiplied by a zero. So that's going to give us B as a half. Now I'm going to let X equal positive one. And I get two on the left. Two times two times a, so I have a four a. Positive one multiplies b by zero. Positive one multiplies c and d by zero. So I get a is a half as well. Okay. Then maybe if I let x equal zero, I'll get rid of the c. And we have zero on the left. If X is zero here. I have a multiplied by one times one. So I do get an a. I have b multiplied by negative one times one. So I get minus b. C, uh, c is multiplied by zero. So I get b multiplied by negative one times one. So I get a minus d. Now put in the one halves for a and b. And it looks like B is going to be zero. Okay. Now we need C, so we need any other number in the whole world. So I've used my two favorites, one and negative one and zero. My two favorites were those three numbers. Um, so, so let's see if we can find C real easily. C is going to be multiplied by an X cubed. B is going to be multiplied by an X cubed. And A is going to be multiplied by an X cubed. Can you see that? C X times X times X will make us an X cube. So C times X cube. B will be multiplied by an X cube. And A will be multiplied by an X cube. And there aren't any X cubes on the left hand side. So I have zero is equal to C plus B plus A. But B plus A is one. So C is negative one. Let's check the back. I didn't. I just I'm equating coefficients here. Oh, okay. I just noticed that C's highest power on X would be an X cube. Okay. But I could have stuck another number in there. I just thought it would take too long. But now that I wasted all this time explaining that to you. <laughs> <laughs> So let's see if we can integrate what's left. We don't forget the x squared over 2. So I have something over x minus 1. I get a half over x minus 1. I get another half over x plus 1. C was negative 1. So I have minus x. D was zero over X squared plus one. And this again is a U, D, U integral. So every one of these are logarithms, right? So our final answer is X squared over two plus one half natural log of X minus one plus one half natural log of X plus one. When I do a u du, I get a half here. It's just minus one gives me a negative one half. Natural log of x squared plus one plus two. Woo! I earned my money today. Don't blow it. Don't eat the cat food. Don't eat the cat food. Good. 
Thank you. Have a marvelous weekend. Oh, I got papers up here. Can you turn your papers? Luke, you got any questions for me? Good. All right, I'm out of here.